Hey YouTube, this is Praxis Prepper, and I want to welcome you to the first installment of my Nuclear War Survival Strategy s Strategy Skills series. There's a lot of S's there. It's a tongue twister. I don't even know what... I, why, what was I thinking trying to name this series something like... If you can come up with a snappy little title and put it in the comments below, I'd love to use something different. I can't even pronounce the title of my own series. But, you know, this, the series is about not dying during a nuclear exchange. How about that? Uh, to that end, uh, my goal here is, is not to make myself or you an, a quote-unquote expert on the topic. Um, it's, that would take years of study, and it's, it's beyond what most of us need, I think, really. Uh, my goal is to just make myself and to share with you enough information that we feel like we are just very knowledgeable on the topic. So that's why I want to start the series. Um, I've gotten, been doing most of my research in, in these books, uh, and I'm going to share them with you right now. Uh, Nuclear War Survival Skills. That's not a bad title. Maybe it should be, well, I can't steal his title. Um, it's written by Crescent Kearney. You can download this book for free right now online. Just search, do a Google search, and you'll be able to find uh, you know, links to this book. He wants to get the information out there. Um, I would recommend getting a hard copy also, because uh, sometimes, you know, <laughs> you know, if there's an EMP or something, or you know, your computer's not functioning, uh, it's nice to have a hard copy, physical one you can flip open. So I would recommend getting, I think it's like 15 bucks or so on Amazon is what I paid for it for this. Uh, the information, a lot of the information in here is a little bit outdated. Um, he still refers to today as being like 1986 <laughs> occasionally. There are updates in here after that, I think, but, you know, you got to go, kind of go through and you're like, oh, I think this is something old. And I, I've been, I'm cross-referencing uh, this material with other material, so I, I'm not polluting you with like, you know, the old acid wash jeans uh, technique for surviving nuclear war and everything. So, very good book. Highly recommend that one. Uh, this is another book. I'm not going to say you should go out and buy this one. Uh, I bought this one first, then I get this one later. There's some good information in here. U.S. Armed Forces, nuclear, biological, blah, 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 blah. Uh, I'm going in here. This has a little bit more updated information. So, it's good for that, but I'm going to be sharing a lot of that with you anyway. The third book uh, is a little bit different, uh, and this is called Strategic Relocation, and this was by, I, I don't really know how to pronounce his last name, Joel Skusen or something like that. Um, it's a cool book, though. Uh, I, the title of it suggests that it's about leaving your house and going someplace else, and it kind of could be, and you could, you know, if you bought this book, you might decide to leave your house. Uh, but what I'm using it for, and what I think is, is really cool about it, is it's a very well-researched book, and they have a lot of maps of all the different states in the U.S. and some of Canada um, showing uh, nuclear, possible nuclear targets. Um, so it's kind of cool if you were able to find out if you, you know, say, live near this giant ring of fire here. You know, maybe you might want to make some alternate arrangements <laughs> or something. Uh, th th these represent missile silos that, uh, you know, would probably be uh, of interest to be in a first wave of attack if there ever was a nuclear war. People would be dropping bombs there to try to disable as many of those as possible. So if you live near there, you know, it might be advantageous to know that. So those three books are what I'm primarily using. I'm also using a, a fourth book, uh, which I'll Keep secret for the moment. We'll be sharing that next week, which is a bit of a curveball. I think you'll find that one interesting uh, when I when I uh, wrap that into it. So, uh, like I said, it's going to be a series of films. Today's the first one, uh, and uh, what I want to talk about today is bombs, blast effects, and fallout. So let's get going. <laughs> The first thing that's important to understand uh, is that the uh, nuclear weapons are not just one thing. Uh, there, there's a variety of different types, there's a variety of different yields, and there's a variety of different delivery mechanisms. Uh, the first nuclear weapons that the U.S. dropped over uh, the people in Japan were uh, about 20 kilotons. Uh, the one was a little less, one was a, a little bit more. Uh, and to, you know, fast forward to today, the largest nuclear weapon that is known to have ever been exploded is a bomb that uh, is called, it's a Russian bomb, uh, and it is allegedly capable of 100 megatons, uh, not kilotons, megatons, 100 megatons. Um, but uh, to my knowledge, it's never been used at that yield. They've kind of done it at a half yield, 
a, a mere 50 megatons uh, because it's something to do with it would create so much fallout that it would destroy the entire planet or something along those lines. There is an uh, an enormous uh, range of, of weapons between you know 20 kilotons and and 50 megatons. Uh, but what's important to know is that the majority of real weaponized uh, nuclear weapons, uh, and that might seem sort of uh, oxymoronical, uh, that a nuclear weapon wouldn't be weaponized, but some of, some of these nuclear weapons are sort of like showpieces and tests, um, and they're kind of like, it'd be difficult to actually deliver anywhere. So the majority of weapons that, that most people think are sort of useful are uh, somewhere between uh, one uh, to 20 megatons. So somewhere between one megaton and 20 megatons. Um, that's still like horrifying if you think that even a one megaton bomb is, um, that's like 1,000 kilotons and the Hiroshima one was only 20 kilotons. So Hiroshima was 20 and even the smallest one we're talking about here is 1,000 uh, kilotons. Um, but uh, the majority of the weapons fall into that category. Um, they also are oftentimes delivered uh, with a delivery vehicle that uh, has uh, multiple warheads on one. Like there, there might be uh, ten one megaton bombs uh, strapped to one uh, um, ballistic missile. So it'll go up, and then each of those missiles will kind of have its own targeting uh, coordinates, and then they'll sort of uh, break off from the mothership, so to speak, and you know do their nasty business in different places. Another thing that's important to keep in mind is that even a single nuclear weapon can depending on how it's used, can, it can have dramatically different uh, impacts on the surrounding area. Uh, for example, a 20 megaton nuclear weapon, if it's exploded up in the sky, about like four miles up or so, that's called air bursting. And uh, if, if that happens, the, um, the energy th thrown out from it hits a much larger area on the ground, uh, out to about 16 miles of blast effect, you know, leveling, leveling structures. Um, uh, versus if it's exploded on the ground, uh, that blast radius is much smaller. Um, uh, but al alternately, um, if uh, it's exploded up in the sky, there's a lot less fallout. The fallout really only happens, the fallout is like, you know, the radiation type of thing, like inhaling particles that, that are going to like give you cancer and things later. Um, the fallout really happens mostly when the, the uh, explosion interacts with the ground itself. When the explosion is up in the air, air burst, there's not nearly as much fallout. There's more destruction, but there's not as much fallout. If it explodes on the ground, there's a lot more fallout because it's grabbing all that material on the ground and, and, make, and you know, making it radioactive. Uh, if a 20 megaton bomb, the same one that can make 60 miles of destruction, uh, if it's air burst uh, above the ground, if it's blown up on the ground, the, uh, the fallout radius uh, of something uh, of that size would extend for about 20 miles, even upwind of a, a, um, a device like that. Downwind, obviously, it would just keep blowing and blowing for hundreds of miles. Um, uh, so that's a 20 megaton nuclear weapon. Uh, for something on the smaller end, a 1 megaton nuclear weapon, if it's air burst, you know, again, 4 or 5 miles up in the air, um, it, it will have a, a destructive radius of about 5 miles. Um, so, you know, it's quite a bit less than a 20 megaton. Uh, if that same uh, 1 megaton weapon is uh, exploded on the ground, uh, the fallout will also be a lot less. Uh, the fallout, um, even upwind, will extend only about 6 miles uh, from, the, uh, uh, from the ground zero of, of that weapon. Uh, it's thought that uh, if there was a nuclear exchange, the majority of the weapons would the intent, anyway, would be for them to be airburst, just because you get so much more uh, damage uh, happening in a given area. Now, there might be some uh, uh, intent by someone that's looking to do this to create fallout and cause chaos uh, from that, but in terms of actually damaging military hardware, destroying runways that could be used as launch platforms, um, airbursting these weapons, uh, someone is going to get a lot more bang for their buck if they're, they're blowing them up in the sky. So there's kind of a nice incentive to reduce <laughs> the, you know, the horrors of fallout, uh, you know, if, if something like that is employed. Uh, in terms of targeting, it's thought that the majority of the weapons on a first strike are going to be going strictly for military targets because if, um, and this is, you know, we're talking about if there's a, a heated exchange with Russia. The idea is, is that they're going to want to reduce as many of our offensive capabilities to slap them back. So the, the first wave is going to go for missile silos, um, uh, things like runways where large bombers could take off from, uh, and things of that nature. 
so if you live near a missile silo, uh, or if you live near a very long runway that can accommodate military aircraft, that's something that you uh, are probably going to need to be concerned about and be aware of. Next, let's talk a little bit about blast and blast effects. Um, it's important to kind of get a sense of what is happening around you, and you can tell a lot by uh, what you witness in your immediate environment. Uh, if you see a bright flash of light up in the sky, uh, first thing, as they always say, is don't look at it. Uh, make sure you get to shelter as quickly as you can. By, and by shelter, I just mean something to uh, remove you from the exposure to that radiation, that light radiation that's traveling at the speed of light and uh, uh, going to immediately start burning your eyes and your skin. So you want to get behind a wall or, or just something that will block you from that. Uh, it doesn't have to be your actual you know, fallout shelter. Um, if that intense light and heat lasts for about 10 seconds, uh, that was probably a one megaton surface uh, burst uh, nuclear weapon. Uh, if it's longer than that, for about 45 seconds or so, then that was probably something more close to a, a 20 megaton nuclear weapon being surface burst. Um, and uh, that gives you some sense of what the blast radius will be, uh, you know, and, and whatnot. Obviously, again, you're not supposed to be looking at it. You don't want to try to be looking to see if it's on the sky or on the ground because you're going to damage your eyes. Uh, but just getting some of that information will, will, will help you have some sense of what, uh, what just occurred near you. Um, it, you should stay in that sort of shelter location for two or three minutes. Uh, and if you're not killed by a blast within those two minutes, you're probably good. <laughs> Oh, okay. Ah, uh, well, it's been about three minutes. I guess it's time to move to my secure location. Uh, I gotta grab some shit first, though. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, in case the aliens invade, too. Uh, and, oh, shit, of course. Uh, need the, the barnyard pornography. Uh, gonna be underground for a couple weeks. So you can move to another location that's more secure. And you want to do that pretty quickly. Get to either a public um, uh, fallout shelter or if you have something set up on your own. You want to get there. And you want to stay there for a couple of days. Even if uh, you're, you have a radiation meter and it's telling you that things are safe outside, um, during an attack, it's likely that some missiles would go off target. Um, you, might, uh, you might live in an area that was intended to be targeted, but it accidentally wasn't. Uh, and the next wave are coming in in the next couple of days. Um, or you, you could just be a second tier target and you know something will be coming in later. So you want to get to the, that secure location and stay there for at least a couple of days. Lastly, I think if you speak to anyone about nuclear war, one of the biggest concerns people, most people seem to have is the radiation. Now obviously the blast and the fire and all that is horrible. Um, I, especially if you're Sarah Connor grabbing onto a chain link fence being burned alive into a human skeleton. I mean, that all sucks, for sure. Uh, but th there's something uniquely creepy, I think, about radiation and fallout and all of that. And it really disturbs people. Um, and it is disturbing. Uh, but I think that our imaginations have also exaggerated it a little bit to be a little bit more terrifying than it necessarily needs to be. Um, and again, there have been a lot of people that have been killed and terribly sickened uh, by fallout. It's not to take away from them, but statistically... Um, if you do get exposed to fallout, it is not an automatic death sentence, and it, it is not even an automatic cancer sentence. Uh, some exposure is survivable, um, even reasonably intense exposure, as long as it's kind of short term. Uh, and additionally, there are a lot of things that, that you and I can do to try to limit that exposure. Um, now, if uh, there is a, an attack, uh, the majority of the fallout is going to be falling out of the sky within the first 12 hours. And the worst of that is going to be falling out during the first two to three hours. Um, uh, and why I say the worst of it be, is because the longer, the, the more time that has uh, passed since the attack uh, occurred, uh, the less radioactivity uh, is, is going to be in any of that material because the radioactivity is, is uh, degrading over time. Um, so uh, the large chunks are going to fall out of the sky first, and the smaller particles are going to stay up there longer, that makes sense. Um, and that's kind of a blessing, because the smaller particles are exactly the kind of things that you and I would be breathing in. So it's nice that they stay up there, and, and uh, from what I'm reading, a lot of those are going to stay up there for weeks or months, uh, and, and slowly get safer and safer and safer, so that's great. The one, uh, <laughs> there's a silver lining there. Everything is awesome. Uh, the, the one exception to that is if there is a, um, 
uh, a rainstorm or a snowstorm that washes that material out of the sky and onto the ground, uh, at which point it can start blowing around and then you have those tiny little particles that are very dangerous and can be inhaled. Um, so, so that is the one, the one exception, but uh, generally speaking, um, as long as you can get into a, a fallout shelter and stay there for two weeks, you're going to avoid the, the, a huge majority of the, um, uh, of the radiation. Uh, if on day one, the, the radio, radioactivity, which is me measured in uh, wrench gens, um, and I don't, don't know if I'm pronouncing that properly. If you look at the way the word's spelled, it's a little, little ambiguous as to how to pronounce it. YouTube told me that... Runt gen or runt gen. If on day one, uh, the, uh, the measurement of rent gens per hour that are in your area is, say, 1,000 rent gens per hour, uh, if you move into a shelter and then just simply come out of your shelter two weeks later, same environment, everything's still there, uh, no cleanup or anything, uh, just the radioactive decay itself will have brought that radioactive, radioactivity level down from 1,000 rent gens per hour down to one rent gen per hour. So uh, it is very survivable as long as you take precautions up front. Even food and things like that, uh, as long as you're, you wash the fallout off of, like, say, an apple on a tree, um, the apple itself isn't harmed. You just need to get that fallout dust off of it. Same for water. If you're capable of filtering the fallout of whatever particle size it is out of your water and you can actually remove the physical fallout with a, with a physical filter, um, the water is safe to, to drink as well. In this map that you see, uh, it demonstrates uh, sort of a computer simulation of what a, uh, a nuclear attack might look like in terms of fallout. Now, this simulation uh, involves surface bursts as opposed to air bursts, um, and you can see uh, sort of generally where the targeting is happening uh, in this simulation. Uh, that the big dark areas are the areas around the missile silos in the Midwest and you know various other locations. Um, and you can also see that there's a general tendency of uh, United States uh, continental winds to be blowing from the west to the east. Now, obviously, this is a, there are plenty of issues with this map. You don't know exactly which direction the winds are going to be blowing in. You don't know exactly what's going to be targeted. So there's a lot of guesses here. Um, but it gives an example of, of what a, a, danger a, a dangerous situation might look like. Uh, obviously, in those darkest areas, those are referred to as the highest risk uh, areas. Those are uh, areas that are exposed to radiation to a degree where people living there would be exposed to ten, tens of thousands uh, of rent gens per hour. Um, in those areas, th those people would be advised to stay in their shelters for a good two to three weeks and then get the hell out of there and, you know, to some degree never go back. Um, uh, in the uh, slightly less dark areas, uh, uh, it, the recommendation is that you would want to stay in your, your, uh, your shelter for two to three weeks, uh, and then kind of, you could leave it, but you also kind of want to be you know, going back to it, sleeping in it, to you know, just reduce your exposure while the, those radiation levels continue to come down and come down and come down. Or you, know, you could evacuate and try to leave too if you think that that's a better option. I feel like I should reiterate at this point that from all the reading that I've been doing, Air bursting seems to be the preferred military method for uh, implementing these nuclear weapons. Uh, surface bursts, while they create more fallout, uh, and I suppose there's strategic benefit to that, uh, don't create nearly as much physical damage. And if you're thinking about doing a first strike or a retaliatory strike, you're going to want to take out as much military hardware as you can, and you're going to be able to do that with air bursting because it just spreads out the damage into such a, a larger area. And if you're not sure how many missiles you're going to get through, you're going to want to maximize the amount of damage that you do with each one. So that, that, that closes out this episode, except for one thing I want to say. I want to address an elephant in the room, and yes, yes, I'm going to build it. I've been talking about shelter this, shelter that, get into your shelter for thus and thus many days. Yeah, I'm, I've already started building one, and I'm going to bring you in on that process. That's what we're talking about next week. Uh, you'll see lots of different shelter designs you might like to, to use yourself. Um, not all of them are very difficult. Um, and the one I'm doing is quite interesting, and it's, it's not going to be just a fallout shelter. What do I have planned? You'll have to wait until next week to find out. <laughs> Thanks for watching.